trees, and there are times when it's Ashworth grade four tone and it's stuck. And this can be painful, yes. and it can markedly interfere with the activities of daily living, people helping you get dressed, etc. Yes. So our goal today was to, uh, to make sure that the Botox worked well for the pectoralis, which it has, and then to see what we can do about the biceps uh, with a uh, phenol block to the musculocutaneous nerve. If we still think of local treatments, which I think are still the most appropriate for you because you still have the possibility maybe to do a few steps to help for your transfer so you don't want to be completely weakened with general treatment. I think the left adductors, right possibly as well, and the left quadriceps would be the main targets for local treatments, a local relaxing, uh, injection of a local relaxing agents on in the muscle, into the muscles, okay? So we'll do that next time. For both medications, the dose is chosen to give the desired degree of weakness, but must be weighed against the risk of producing adverse effects. For botulinum toxin, the principal adverse effect is temporary excess weakness, which may be caused by injection of too high an amount of toxin. Because botulinum toxin targets the neuromuscular junction, its use is not associated with the sensory effects seen in phenol chemodenervation and may even relieve pain associated with spasticity. The main risks uh, to be aware of when uh, using phenol for spasticity management uh, have to do with the uh, risks of poking the patient with a needle, uh, that is you can uh, injure the nerve that uh, you're seeking to uh, block. Um, you can inadvertently put the needle into other structures such as a, a vein or an artery or you can cause pr problems with phenol in the tissues themselves. Uh, the main uh, problem that we've seen uh, with phenol is when the phenol gets on a mixed nerve and causes initially an area of reduced sensation in the distribution of the sensory nerve or subsequently a problem with causalgia or neuralgic type pain uh, as the uh, uh, damaged sensory nerve starts uh, firing with aberrant uh, signal. Uh, there are other reported complications from phenol injections and these primarily have to do with uh, patients who have received motor point blocks, that is large volumes of phenol, more than one cc of phenol for example, into the forearm and patients can develop edema in the tissues, they can develop venous thrombosis, compartment syndromes and other uh, uh, more serious sequelae. At, at more potent uh, concentrations of phenol, for example, 10%, you end up with a more damage effect on the nerve. You can denature the axon protein, for example, and that uh, can be a permanent effect, uh, which is generally not desired uh, in the clinic. Initial doses and dose ranges of botulinum toxin type A by muscle for pediatric and adult patients have been established by consensus. However, additional considerations must be addressed in determining whether to adjust the starting dose within the range given. Suggested dose modifiers are presented in the print materials accompanying this program. For children, botulinum toxin uh, is dosed uh, by body weight. Uh, and uh, for uh, Derek's body weight, uh, uh, his considered uh, uh, maximum dose would be 300 units. Uh, and that's uh, what we'll inject uh, total. Uh, he will receive approximately five units uh, per kilogram uh, into uh, each uh, gastrocnemia solus muscle group. Uh, we do injections into uh, the medial and lateral head uh, of the muscle and generally we'll uh, inject into two separate sites in each one of those heads. So uh, Derek will uh, receive a total of eight injections with four injections on each side. His skin uh, has been prepped with Imla. It, it numbs the skin, it doesn't numb the muscle. Uh, however, for some children, uh, taking away the pain uh, of the injection through the skin uh, helps them tolerate the procedure better. Uh, Derek's also been sedated with oral Versed uh, to help him tolerate the procedure more. Uh, we also have our child life uh, specialist present to help uh, uh, with uh, Derek uh, so that he can tolerate the procedure better as well. Okay. Uh, generally I will uh, pick a site at the, about the top third border of each muscle belly as well as the bottom third border.
The proper targeting and dosing of muscles is a crucial factor in achieving efficacy and reducing adverse effects from chemodenervation injections. Proficiency demands skill development and a substantial time commitment. As you inject, sometimes you, you push in when you're injecting. And so what I, the way I teach the residents and, and everyone is to stabilize the needle on the skin with your hand and then inject and make sure you have a firm grip on that needle so that as you inject, you're not moving the needle at all. The needle stays in one spot. Because if you don't stabilize the needle and you're just holding it way up here and you inject, the tendency is to push in as you inject so you actually advance the needle as you inject. The number of injection sites is primarily determined by the size of the muscle. It may be appropriate to inject more sites with smaller doses providing wider distribution to nerve terminals. However, too many injection sites may contribute to undesirable use on areas such as the musculotendinous junction where no nerve terminals exist. Difficult to localize muscles often require adjunctive tools to confirm injection sites. The objective in electromyography or electrical stimulation monitoring is to facilitate localization of the target muscles with precision including patients with very little voluntary control. That's her adductor longus. Okay. Now, as I'm injecting, you see the amplitude decreases. We're halfway done. Trying to maximize that muscle contraction at the lowest possible intensity. And here we're at two. Off. Injected about a half of a cc. The uh, posterior tibialis muscle runs deep right behind the tibia, uh, right behind the tibia. And, and the approach I like to use is the anterior medial approach where we will be um, going right behind the tibia and to get right underneath the tibia to get into tibialis posterior. It's a very deep muscle. Another approach is you can use the anterior approach and go through the tibialis anterior which in my experience is uh, uh, limited in that when you go through the interosseous membrane to enter the posterior tibialis muscle, the muscle often spasms, and in which case your needle will bend. And I've had a, a couple needles bend on me about 90 degrees, and after that happened, I've decided to stick with the uh, anterior medial approach, and uh, most patients tolerate that just fine. Now, to, to use this approach, you have to use at least a 50 millimeter needle uh, to get behind the tibia. And so that's why I use a 